is, have you learned to trust God when the going gets tough? Christians all over the world are facing issues where the going is tough. Some of them are being persecuted. Some of them are losing their jobs. Some of them are being thrown in jail. Some of them are being beaten. Some of them are being starved. Some of them are being killed right now as I speak. Your brothers, your sisters in Christ. Countries all over the world are doing that to other believers who are part of the body of Christ. And when one member suffers, the entire body suffers. But we try to insulate ourselves. We try to isolate ourselves. We try to pretend that it's not happening. But people, it's coming here to the United States. I think it will be not too far distant future that you and I may face the same types of things that our brothers and sisters are facing in other parts of the world. We need to learn to trust God rather than trusting our own hoarded resources because those resources will soon be gone. God postponed war for Israel. Did you hear that in the, the text? In verse 17 it said, He led them not the way of the land of the Philistines, for God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. The first thing God does in your spiritual life is He teaches you to trust Him and to follow him through the wilderness of this world. But there is coming a time when you will also have to go to war. Some of the people never got, by the way, to that second level of practical or progressive sanctification because during their training program, that first level, learning to trust God walking through the wilderness, most of them failed. The people of God rebelled against him, it says, ten times in the wilderness training. And so God ultimately killed all of those who were 20 years older and older at the time of the Exodus. That's a serious warning. That's what happens to God's people when they rebel in the way of the wilderness. When they rebel in their time of training, learning to walk by faith and trust him. Last week, you recall, we looked at Numbers chapter 14, which dealt with that. The children of Israel are griping and moaning and groaning, and they're murmuring against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said, Would to God that we died in the land of Egypt, or would to God that we died in the wilderness. God says, You really want that? Oh, you wish that you had died in Egypt? Oh, you wish you died in the wilderness? Okay, I'll accommodate you. I'm going to kill you in the wilderness! Be careful what you ask God for. You might just get it. With God, we died in the wilderness. Wherefore, if the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey, were it not better for us to return to Egypt? You know, there are a lot of Christians who want to go back. A lot of Christians who miss the things of earth, the, the things of the world, the way that they used to live for the world, the flesh, the devil, the demons. They want to go back and do all that fun stuff again. When you're saved, you can't go back, but you can die. You can die. You want to go back to the sinful ways that you had before? You can die. New Testament says, there is a sin unto death, and I do not say that he shall pray for it. Be careful, you might be on the verge of committing a sin unto death. It can be theological error, but usually it's practical error, deciding you want to live for the flesh. And boy, there's a lot that you can live for the flesh. But if you're a Christian, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you do those things, you're standing on the edge of the cliff. And God might finally say, you know, it's one too many times, you're dead. Oh, people, it's serious. God means business with his people. You represent him in this world. And if you are a lousy representative, he can take you home at any time. Me too. You need to be careful. That wasn't part of the sermon that I wrote, but there it is. We get down a little bit farther. We find God is saying to Moses, he says, I'm going to kill all these people. How long will these people provoke me? How long will it be that they believe me for the, all the signs I've showed them? I will smite them with the pestilence. I will disinherit them. I will make thee, speaking to Moses, a greater nation and mightier than they. And Moses, amazingly, instead of saying, that's great, Lord, I'm really tired of dealing with them too. Kill them all and I'm your man. He doesn't do that. Instead, he says, Lord, don't kill them. 
I don't want to be number one man. Don't kill them because you made some promises to them. And all the Canaanites and all the Perizzites and all the Hittites and all the Hivites and all the Jebusites, all those people who have heard about you will say, well, God was able to get them out of Egypt, but they are so rebellious, he can't handle them himself. He had to kill them instead. And your name will be dragged through the mud. Moses was more concerned about the name of God than he was about his own power and glory. Are you concerned about the name of God, the way in which you live? The way in which you live tells the world about the God you worship. How do you live? That's all they can see. They can't see God, but they can see you and you claim to be his representative. How do you live? Do you live a holy life? Do you live a pure life? Do you life, live a life filled with zeal for Christ? Do you witness faithfully and then you show what it means to be a Christian? By the way in which you live. We get down to the end. God says, all right, I won't kill them. But, verse 21, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. God killed them. There was a minimum of two million people that left Egypt. I think there were probably closer to six million, but that's a point to argue. But everybody admits there are at least two million. Only two guys made it in, Joshua and Caleb, who were adults at the time of the Exodus. That's one in a million. How many of you like those odds? Would you, if, if there was a, a, a machine gun that had a million bullets in it and only one empty chamber would you stand in front of a machine gun and say spin that as much as you want and then pull the trigger once would you like those odds <laughs> that there would be one blank chamber that wouldn't put a bullet through your head that's what happened to Israel one in a million and they missed and they died only two guys made it Joshua and Caleb. The New Testament makes a big point out of that. First Corinthians chapter 10, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual meat, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. In other words, everybody had the same shot at it. Everybody in that entire company had all the same blessings. Every one of them got manna. Every one of them drank that rock that miraculously came out of the rock. Every one of them walked through the desert for 40 years and their shoes did not wear out. Every one of them saw the cloud. Every one of them saw the pillar of fire. Every one of them got to worship at the tabernacle of God in the wilderness. Every one of them had their daily needs met every step of the way. They all had the same blessings, but they didn't all do the same thing with the blessings they had. What are you doing with the blessings you have in Christ? Do you know all of us who are believers have exactly the same blessings? We don't have the same gifts, but we have the same blessings that God has poured out on all of us. What are you doing with the gifts, the blessings, the resources, the time, the talent, the energy, the, the financial money that you've got. What are you doing with it for the glory of God instead of the glory of the flesh? What are you doing with what God has given you? Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, With many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now you say, well, boy, that was sure a cool story. No, Paul says, that was to teach you something. Verse 6, he says it, and he says it again in verse 11. Now these things were our examples. Do you know why the children of Israel died in the wilderness? Do you know why all those things happened to them in the wilderness? Why sometimes there were serpents, and sometimes there were enemies, and sometimes there was 
hunger and starvation and thirst and all the bad things. You know why those things happened? It says they were our examples to teach us a lesson in five different ways to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Sin number one. Neither be you idolaters, verse seven, as were some of them. Lesson number two. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Lesson number three. Neither let us commit fornication, sexual immorality, as some of them committed and fell in one day 23,000. God killed 23,000 people in one day because they were fornicating. That's sexual immorality. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted. Sin number four, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured. Sin number five, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now he says it again in verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. They are written for our admonition. That is to warn us. This is how God deals with his own people. That's how he dealt with his people, Israel in the Old Testament. And that is how God deals with his people, the church, in the New Testament. You better not get involved in that stuff, people. Because what did God do to those people in Israel? He was trying to teach them to be holy. He didn't let them see war at first. He led them through the wilderness so they'd learn to trust him every day, trusting him for their food and their water. Every day, trusting him for the path that they had to walk down. Every day, trusting him as they went through the wilderness and learned to obey God. That's an example for us. And what did they do? They fell into at least five categories of sins. Are you doing those things? How about in your thoughts? Are you doing those things in your thoughts? You say, well, I never have actually physically done that, but, but do you think about it? Jesus made it very clear, if you hate somebody, you've murdered them. He made it clear, if you're lusting after somebody, you've committed adultery. Dear people, God sees your heart. He doesn't just see what you do on the outside. They were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Don't get proud about it because you're getting set up for a fall. But God guarantees that you never have to fall into it. Listen, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Every temptation you have ever faced is a common temptation. It's common. Everybody in the world faces it at some time or another. The question is, how are you going to respond to it? What are you going to do with it? When the temptation falls on you like a ton of bricks, how will you respond? It's common temptation, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you, that is, he won't allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. We mentioned last week there are five specific sins listed. Lust, that's desiring forbidden things. Idolatry, we pointed out that twice in the New Testament it says that covetousness is idolatry and that the covetous man is an idolater. You got your eyes set on this big fancy chunk of jewelry, you ladies, or that beautiful mink coat, or that, you guys, Maserati or Lamborghini. You know, oh man, I wish I had one of those. I'd punch it to the floor. You know, that's idolatry. You say, man, I, I, I want to win the lottery, so I, I keep buying these tickets, and you're a fool if you do. The odds are even worse there than they are with the, the one in the million in the wilderness, you know, getting the bullet in their head. Covetousness is idolatry. The covetous man is an idolater. God's word says so. Fornication covers all the forms of sexual immorality, all the perversions that we see today, sex outside of marriage, adultery, everything that you could possibly imagine, don't imagine it. Fornication, that's the word that covers it all. Tempting God. See how far you can go before God strikes you. How close can I get to the edge of the cliff before I fall off? Murmuring. That's complaining. That's the one that finally brought his judgment. Do you gripe? Do you complain? You know, they didn't think they were complaining against God. They were just complaining about circumstances. God said, I'm the one that put you in that circumstance. Why are you complaining against me? And God killed them for it. 
Those can all be summarized by one sin category that we mentioned last week. God called their failure a failure of faith. A failure of faith. Hebrews chapter 3, 7 through 19. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation in the day of the temptation in the wilderness. So we know what we're talking about. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart. God sees your heart. He doesn't just look at what you're doing. God looks inside. They've not known my ways. He was trying to teach them to walk in his ways. Why do you think he led them through the wilderness? Learning to trust him. Walk in his ways. If you walk where he walks, he will always provide for you. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. We just read that in Numbers. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you. Ah, any of you. This is an application for us. What happened in the wilderness? Now listen to how he summarizes it. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Did you know every time you don't walk in his ways, you prove you don't have faith. You have an evil heart, God says. It's an evil heart of unbelief. You're departing from the living God. You say, well, it's really not that bad. Oh, really? Verse 13 applies to you then. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be... Now listen, hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, sin tries to deceive you. It says, look, it's really not that bad. Or everybody else is doing it. You know, or well, you know, I know everybody else is, you know, they're, they're driving 75 miles an hour and it's a 65 mile an hour speed zone. And, you know, after all, I don't want to hold the traffic up and, I'll go along with the crowd. I'll drive 75. And then if I drive just slightly less fast than they, maybe when the policeman puts his radar out there, he'll catch one of them and not catch me. Listen, I hope he catches you. The deceitfulness of sin tells you it's okay to do what everybody else is doing. The deceitfulness of sin tells you it's okay to go along with the crowd. The deceitfulness of sin tells you it's really not that bad because our culture permits it. Oh, really? What does God say? Thus saith the Lord. God calls it an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the ways of the living God. Don't be deceived by sin. He says it again down in verse 15. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, for some, when they had heard, did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. <laughs> there were two guys that made it, Joshua and Caleb. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell into the wilderness, and to whom he sware that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now you know those people tried to repent. When God said, you're not going to go in, I'm going to kill you. They said, oh, no, no, we want to go in. Those spies came back and they said, there are giants in the land. It's really, really tough. God said, okay, you're not going to go in. They said, what, you mean you're going to kill us in the wilderness? No, no, we'll go in. God said, don't do it. You have reached the point of no return. You know, God is a long-suffering God. He's a charitable God. He's a loving God. He's a kind God. But the scripture makes it clear that you can reach a point of no return. Let that sink in. These things were written as examples for us because the children of Israel reached a point of no return. And they wanted to go in. You know, in Numbers 20, uh, 14, uh, in verse 30, it says, Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. And those little ones that you said are going to be a prey, I'll bring them in. They'll know the land that you despised. But your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. So they began to murmur again. And so God killed all the spies except Joshua and Caleb. And Moses told these things to the children of Israel, and they mourned greatly. And verse 40, 
They rose up early in the morning and gathered them up to the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here. We will go up to the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. Now, folks, they should have said that 40 years earlier. You know, David had mercy. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. And Nathan the prophet came into him and told him a story. He said, you know, David, I got a problem here with a guy. He says, tell me the problem. He says, well, there was this guy and um, he had one pet lamb and all the kids loved it. In fact, they even cuddled it and fell asleep with it. And, you know, the whole family loved it. And this rich guy who had lots of lambs and lots of sheep, he came and took that one pet lamb and killed it and ate it. And David was furious. And he said, that man shall die. And Nathan the prophet pointed his finger at David and said, thou art the man. David didn't wait 40 years to repent. He said, I have sinned. I have sinned. Nathan said, therefore you won't die. But you will pay back fourfold. David lost four of his sons. His kingdom went into rebellion through his sons after that. He lost his honor. Even though God spared his life, it cost him. The children of Israel waited 40 years to repent. And finally when God said, now I'm going to kill you, I've put up with you ten times you've rebelled against me. They said, we don't want to go into the land. Then God said, okay, I'll kill you now. They said, no, do that. We'll go up and we'll try to take the mountain. Uh, we'll go and fight just like you told us to. And God says, don't, don't do it. Don't bother to do it because they're going to kill you there. Listen to it, what it says here. Moses said, wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? It shall not prosper. Go not up. For the Lord God is not among you that you be smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you. And you shall fall by the sword because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. Now verse 44. There's a very important word in verse. This is in Numbers chapter 14. We're still back in that Numbers passage which is illustrating what's going on in our text. Numbers 14, 44. If you don't have it, open your Bible there. There's a very important word in this verse. Numbers 14, 44. It says, But they presumed. How often have we presumed upon God? Well, we'll try to make it all right and then he'll go along with us. But they presumed. God said, don't do it. Moses said to him, look, I see what you guys are doing. Don't do it. God's not with you. But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Moses said, I'm not going to be part of that. You guys are in rebellion. You think I'm going to go up there? You think that God dwells in the Ark and that he'll go up there with you? No, we're not going to do that. I don't care what you do, but you're in trouble. Verse 45, Then the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites, which dwelt in that hill, and smote them, and discomfited them, even unto Hormah. They lost it. Remember, there is a point of no return. There is no turning back, no repentance will recover for you what you have lost. You remember Esau in Hebrews 12. Esau repented too late. He, went, he reached the point of no return. Hebrews 12, starting in verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Did you know you can't see the Lord without holiness? Are you following after peace and holiness? Are you following after holiness without which no man shall see the Lord? That's Hebrews 12, 14. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, 
That was what was happening here in the wilderness. God was being gracious and providing for them, but they kept griping and complaining. And there's what happened. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. When you get bitter, when you murmur and groan and complain, that's what they were doing. They were showing a bitter spirit. Do you have a bitter spirit? A bitter spirit is one of the worst things that a church can have. It destroys the church. It splits the church. It absolutely flattens new Christians, weak Christians. A bitter spirit, they leave and they don't want to come back. It will not only trouble you, but it will defile many others too. Then we get to the illustration, verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator, that sexual immorality, or a profane person, someone who wants to live like a pagan, like the secularists around us. There are so many Christians that if they were put on trial, you'd never be able to convict them of being a Christian because they don't have any evidence in their life. They live like the secular world, the profane person. They don't want to be known for being a Christian. They don't want to stand out. Uh, they don't want anybody to guess even that they might be a Christian. So they laugh at the dirty jokes. Uh, they do all the things that all the rest of the people do. They get drunk at the, at the office parties, you know. And a fornicator or a profane person, and it gives you an illustration, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. His stomach was more important to him than the blessings of God. His stomach was more important to him than the blessings of God. He sold it to Jacob for a bowl of bean soup. Then later he wanted it back. But look what happened in verse 17. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He was really, 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 really sorry for what he had done. But it was too late. It was too late. He missed a blessing. Now let me pause for just a second. You cannot lose your salvation. When God gives you salvation, he gives you eternal life. That lasts for eternity. But you can lose your blessings. Things that last forever. You can lose your usefulness in service. That is opportunities for gaining heavenly rewards. You can lose the influence that you might have had on the life of an unsaved person or on the life of a younger Christian just by one little sin. That was Esau. He repented, but he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. David didn't want the baby to die. He fasted and wept and prayed. But the baby died. And so did three more of his sons. That brings us to the next generation. The generation that was spared from dying in the wilderness, the children who grew up to be adults, they also had their shot at doing what God wanted them to do, but they have additional things that they illustrate for us. They illustrate spiritual warfare when they got to the, uh, the promised land. Canaan is not a picture of heaven. We don't have to conquer giants when we get to heaven. They had to conquer giants when they got into the land. Canaan is a picture of spiritual warfare and the process of progressive or practical sanctification. In scripture, a generation is usually counted as 40 years. Now, I said this several weeks ago. Good to remember it at this point. Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood has passed its 75th anniversary. We are approaching the end of the second 40 years of the church, the end of the second generation. We are strikingly reminded of this by the recent death in the church that have brought sorrow to our heart. Will we fail our test as a church? 
like the first generation failed in the wilderness and the second generation failed in their conquest of the land and ultimately after more failures went into the Assyrian captivity and the Babylonian captivity. In other words, the conquest of the land continues to illustrate the doctrine of progressive sanctification and the aspect of spiritual warfare that is this generation at Bible Presbyterian Church. The battle forces of the spiritual enemy are surrounding us and growing both on the national scene and on the international scene. I hope you've noticed that. Everything from sodomite so-called marriages at home to insane suicidal terrorism abroad, but marching swiftly toward our shores. We'll study that more in detail if we ever make it to the book of Joshua. Hope the Lord comes back before then. But let me give you a brief summary of the principles illustrated in Joshua. Just as the enemies of Israel were real, the battles were real, and people got killed, even so, in spiritual warfare, our enemies are real, the battles are real, and people really get killed. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The difference is that our enemies are far more powerful than the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amalekites, the Moabites, and the Edomites. And our enemies are invisible. Spiritual warfare. I'm just going to give you an outline of this because we have only four minutes to go. A major component of progressive sanctification is in developing spiritual muscle. They first had to learn to walk by faith. Then they had to develop muscle in their lives. Spiritual muscle, learning to do battle in the strength of the Lord as we press toward three things expressed by three key words used in the New Testament for progressive sanctification. Number one, the first word, if you're taking notes, and I hope you're taking notes, that's why those little sheets are in your bulletin, they have lots of lines on them, and I hope you have a pencil, you should bring a pencil or a pen. Number one, serving. The first key to spiritual warfare is serving. Serving the King of Kings with our gifts, with our talents, with our testimony in front of the watching world. Number two, the second key word is walking. Walking. Walking by patient, obedient faith, not by sight, when we don't know the future. In other words, learning to obey God's rules even when it seems to be impossible. Even when shortcuts appear to be so tempting in trying to reach our goals. Listen, God never puts you on a shortcut that's going to lead you into danger. God keeps you on the path. Follow the light. We walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Third word, growing. Growing. Growing in holiness and purity so that we will reflect him rather than being soiled by the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons. We fight on a bloody battlefield. We fight in a filthy world. We come in contact with grossly defiled reprobates and sinners even in the church. But we wear the armor of God that protects us and keeps us from defilement. Jesus walked in this world, and every day he came in contact with sinners, yet he himself was without sin. He sets the example for us of how to have compassion on the sinful with the greatest love and humility, and yet he himself never became defiled. Remember what the New Testament teaches about spiritual warfare as we are headed for heaven? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's what they wrestled against back there. In the Old Testament, what were they fighting? They were fighting real people. Hittites, Amalekites, Jebusites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Hittites, Moabites, Edomites. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You've got an invisible enemy, and he's more powerful than all of those human enemies, including the giants. More powerful than all of them put together. How are you going to win? You've got to be saved first, or you're a goner. But then you've got to put on the armor of God, and you've got to develop spiritual muscle. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. You don't like soldiers who run away in battle, do you? Who go AWOL. You're standing there trying to defend, and the rest of your group runs away. And man, you wish there was somebody to defend you on the right and on the left, because you're heading forward and everybody else is running backward. 
the body of Christ is a unit you are needed by the other believers they are needed by you God put you in this church for a reason we have a very key position in the spiritual battle most of us don't want to admit that we say oh it's too, too small a group no God brought you here for a reason you're part of this cohort that has to move forward in some very key strategic battles take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand you don't run stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth having on the breastplate of righteousness your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God here's your sword folks praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit you've got to have contact with headquarters and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds can you imagine taking an ambassador from a foreign country and throwing him into jail just because the ambassador Paul says I'm an ambassador in bonds pray that I'll be able to speak boldly and not to wishy-washy that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak oh man how powerful are our spiritual enemies I want to take you over to Daniel and Jude and Revelation next week you got some tough fights ahead but you can win in the power of the Lord gracious father we thank you once again that you have called us that you saved us that you've put us in Christ and now you've got us on the road of growing in Christ you brought us through the wilderness wanderings where we've learned to walk by faith learn to trust you for our daily provisions our daily needs as you did with Israel in the wilderness now you're bringing us into warfare we see it all around us the enemy is gathering that our clouds the storm clouds are on the horizon we hear the thunder we hear the rumbling we see the enemy marching across the tops of the hills and heading toward our tiny camp but you are God you are more powerful than anything in the universe and you have called us to be soldiers of Jesus Christ let us never fear the enemy because you are with us having done all to stand and to stand with all the spiritual armor of God on that we might be pleasing to him who has called us to be soldiers for we pray it in Jesus name Amen our closing hymn today is number 316 O sacred head now wounded with joy and grief bowed down number